All right, heresy, pressors and trauma. I don't know about how many of y'all, but I was taught you never use vasopressors in patients with traumatic hemorrhagic shock. And I think more and more people are starting to question that dogma, and that's what we're going to do today. So a little bit of background. So first of all, I put out a poll on a lot of my social media channels, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but essentially I asked, in adult patients in a a motor vehicle collision and hemorrhagic shock, in addition to TXA, massive transfusion protocol, and definitive hemorrhage control, would you consider pressors? And it was a pretty interesting split here. 50% of people said yes, so maybe not all of us believe in that dogma. But there was still 35% that said maybe and another 15% that said no, absolutely not. And so I think this is worth talking about. So this is probably the best paper that I am aware of that looks at the use of vasopressors in trauma patients. It's titled Vasopressors in Trauma, a Never Event. Uh, was published back in 2021, and it was a narrative review. It goes through all the pathophysiology of what is actually occurring and whether there's a role for vasopressors. And I'm going to paraphrase them here, but basically what they said is shock in trauma patients is complex. Vasopressors are controversial and require a nuanced approach. Now, in that same narrative review, they basically talk about two phases of hemorrhagic shock the sympatho-excitatory phase and the sympatho-inhibitory phase. Now, in the sympatho-excitatory phase, what ends up happening is stroke volume goes down because of hemorrhage, and so to compensate for cardiac output, heart rate goes up and sympathetic drive goes up, which then increases vasoconstriction. So these patients tend to maintain their mean arterial pressure and their systolic blood pressures in this phase, but are rather tachycardic. Now, as the adrenal glands and the pituitary are secreting all their norepinephrine, epinephrine, and vasopressin respectively, what ends up happening is those chemicals start becoming depleted. And so a couple of things start to happen. So they call it the sympatho-inhibitory phase because of two things. Number one is we start depleting these uh, hormones, and so we start having kind of a more relaxed state for our patients. But the second reason is, is that the receptors that these hormones attach to also start becoming less sensitive to them. So we still get that lower stroke volume like we had in the sympatho-excitatory phase, but then what starts to happen is our heart rate starts to drop, our sympathetic drive starts to drop, and then we end up with vasodilation, and this is when our patients start to tank. So, pressors and hemorrhagic shock maybe makes sense. So, this is kind of the way I look at it. So, this is kind of the spectrum of a patient coming in in hemorrhagic shock after a trauma. They have hemorrhage, they start getting an increase in norepinephrine, epinephrine, and vasopressin, which maintains blood pressure until they don't anymore, and then they start getting hypotensive. Now, the initial focus should always be on uh, blood products, one to one to one, TEG which we've already done a talk on, and then definitive hemorrhage control. But a lot of places, like I work at some freestanding ERs where all I have are two PRBCs and a gram of TXA. I I can't really do a great resuscitation. I also, because I'm at a freestanding emergency department, can't really get definitive hemorrhage control. And so I'm sure there's other people in similar situations. And so maybe there is a role for vasopressors in these patients as a bridge to get them to a more definitive destination. Now, the best trial that I am aware of looking at vasopressors in trauma is the AVERT shock trial. Um, This was published in JAMA Surgery back in 2019. This is not a new trial. It's been out for a few years. And basically, it was a randomized clinical trial, single center, level one trauma center, to be included, you had to have already received greater than or equal to six units of blood products, and your injury had to be less than or equal to 12 hours from the accident. Now, you were excluded, there was a long list, but some of the key components were if you had a pre-hospital traumatic arrest, if you had a traumatic brain injury that was requiring neurosurgery, or if you were requiring emergent thoracotomy, those were three of the key situations where you were automatically excluded from this study. Basically, head-to-head, 
Vasopressin given as a four unit bolus and then titrated as a drip zero to 0 0.04 units per minute compared to placebo bolus and then an infusion of placebo. And they did this for a total of 48 hours, but they only did it after definitive hemorrhage control, which is always the kind of little hook there. Now they titrated their placebo and vasopressin to maintain a map of greater than or equal to 65 millimeters of mercury. Now we can have long debates about permissive hypotension and whether that's something that we should be doing or if this is the target we should be going for, but that's what they did in this study. And then if patients required more vasopressors, they were getting things like phenylephrine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Now the outcomes of note in this study. So primary outcome was total volume of blood products transfused at 48 hours. And the specific blood products were packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, and platelets. Cryoprecipitate was not included in this total volume of blood products, but separately was looked at. And then the key secondary outcomes were total volume of crystalloids received, 30-day mortality, ICU length of stay, presser requirements, and then any secondary complications. So as for their population, it was 100 adult trauma patients, of which 79% were penetrating trauma and 21% were blunt trauma. Now, if we look at the primary results, what I'm going to tell you is that total blood products is their primary outcome. But I went ahead and broke this down by each individual blood product because I think it's important to know this. Now, the blue boxes notate statistically significant. The red box notates not statistically significant. Although for PRBCs, I have to tell you that p-value was 0 0.08. It was barely not statistically significant. The bottom line here is, though, if you look at the amount of blood products that were given in vasopressin compared to placebo, across the board, vasopressin did much better in terms of using less blood products. Now, I gave you a bunch of key secondary outcomes, and I'm going to list those here for you as well. Unfortunately, small trial, not powered well enough. None of these outcomes were statistically significant, but there were numeric trends that showed benefit with vasopressin. The only one that didn't show anything was 30-day mortality, which was 12% in vasopressin and 12% in placebo. So although we didn't show mortality benefit, we also didn't show harm, which I think is a really important thing because the dogma here that we're working with is to never use vasopressors in traumatic patients. So I think that is a key finding, even though it's not statistically significant. So what is the importance of vert shock trial? Well, for me, it's three components. Number one, blood products are a finite resource. And clearly, there's a complete signal that use of vasopressin reduces blood product use compared to placebo. But more importantly, the use of vasopressin didn't result in more complications or a higher mortality compared to placebo. So what's the bottom line here? Well, the truth about using vasopressors in hemorrhagic shock, especially in trauma, most likely lies between absolutely not and absolutely yes. It's probably this nuanced area of maybe, which is so many things in medicine. So will I reach for vasopressors if I have a trauma patient requiring massive transfusion protocol? And I would say that after resuscitation, so that would be blood products, packed red blood cells, FFP, platelets, cryoprecipitate, TXA, and even definitive hemorrhage control if I can get it, if pressors are still needed, I'm, I'm considering it. And it is something that I'm willing to do and is something that I've done in my practice. So there you have it. Heresy. Pressors in trauma. I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments, and questions. Appreciate you guys tuning in and looking forward to some interaction.